Thank you for allowing us to join you. I say we even though it's just me talking right now because my dad is always with me. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2001 and he's still with us today, fighting hard and funny as ever. We've made three feature length documentaries about Parkinson's, our love of baseball, family, time, and life itself. The award winning series is called Boys of Summer and we're planning on making five films in all. The first two films run about 90 minutes apiece, and they're available on our website if you'd like to check them out. The latest, which just premiered online for Father's Day weekend, is true to its name, Shortstop. It clocks in at about 55 minutes. We're definitely planning more screenings of that one, and if you're interested, please let me know. In the meantime, I've cut a few clips to share with you. I believe this project is uniquely important because of the scope of time it covers. It's a history of what having PD is like against the backdrop of an evolving family relationship. When we're done here today, I'd really love your feedback. I'll have all my contact info up at the last slide. Here's the first clip to give you an overview of what Boys of Summer is about. When my dad and I decided it was time to complete our dream. We grabbed our gloves, a ball, warmed up with a quick catch, then hopped in my dad's Explorer and hit the road. We road tripped 20,000 miles in two months and saw a game at all 30 Major League Baseball parks. Yes, we did. We camped, tailgated, played catch, met fellow baseball fans, fathers, sons, and Parkinsonians. We even met with several top Parkinson's authorities who said they really thought Parkinson's would be cured in 10 years. But here's the problem with dreams. Eventually you wake up and much as we dreamed a cure for Parkinson's would be found by now, it hasn't. In the first film, Dad and I learned a lot about each other, as you do when you're on the road together for two months straight. Funny story, I actually heard from a potential film distributor who said our film's problem was Dad and I got along too well. One of the really surprising things I learned was that Dad wasn't that big of a baseball fan. The truth was, he saw what a fan I was and used going to the game to strengthen our relationship. He knew his grandfather and father had a very poor relationship. My dad's relationship with his father was good, but he wanted more with me. Baseball is a vehicle that has brought us closer together. Like many parents and kids, not just fathers and sons, because there are plenty of moms and daughters who are fans too, no matter what else is going on, even if there's nothing else to talk about, we can always talk baseball. Sometimes we catch a game on TV, but going to the games is where it's at. On our trip back in 2004, we often learn the most by listening to other fans. Was, was there any time that you felt that maybe baseball was a way that you could communicate with your dad, that it was maybe an inroad where if you had a tough time talking otherwise? Um. I, I didn't communicate very well even at a ball game with him. We disagreed on everything, but uh, you know, I think he was uh, he was right about a lot of things. You know, so that's how we are now. We disagree on everything too. He's 14. We can't agree on anything. David, would you say you disagree with your father? Yeah. Well, now you just agreed on that. I <laughs> know. Oh, I don't. I was diagnosed April 1999. I had been suffering from symptoms for a while, so there was a sense of, of relief now that we knew what it was, but, but the more we learned about the disease and, and more of the what-ifs, the more we were anxious about, about all of that. The first documentary won awards and received lots of kind praise. We even had a near miss with a Hollywood family that was interested in adapting our work. But that was right about the time one of them stopped winning and started drinking tiger blood or something like that. After a few years, we thought we were done with our part, which was okay because the cure was on its way. But after 10 years passed and there was no cure, we realized this Parkinson's is ours, maybe for life. Now I want to be clear too when I say ours. Dad is certainly the one who deals with the direct effects of Parkinson's the most, and I hate that. But it also affects the rest of us. Those of you who consider yourself care partners know what I mean. So our question became, what could we do? The short answers given by far too many Western doctors are medication and surgery. Now don't get me wrong, 
They're great for what they do, but the surgical options for my dad range from highly unappealing to simply impossible. And by 2014, the medication offered to my dad was pretty much pain pills. So we struck out to find something new in the sequel documentary, Second Base. So I looked around and I found a doctor who had a different approach. He liked our story, loved baseball, and of all places, he lived in my hometown of Las Vegas. Let me ask you, for those who look at your methods and modalities and say, this guy's a quack, yeah. what do you say? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, trust me, I, I wake up every single day and I kind of laugh about it because I'm like, I'm like, look at this. I mean, how, how far we've come in, in looking at what we do. But the reality of it is this, the end of the day, my main goal is a well patient. Truth be told, I could not care how they get from A to Z. Infrared light is like a very long wavelength that's in the red end of the rainbow or spectrum. And the redder the light within this tissue transparency window of the near infrared range it's called, the deeper it penetrates into the body so that we can take advantage of it in medicine to uh, grow and regenerate and heal. The nutritional plan that Dr. Dean Martinez is putting you on is the cellular healing program. There are six basic steps. One, there's not gonna be any sugar in your diet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> step one. <laughs> so the curvature degree between what would be level here and then what that curve is is 55 degrees. Okay, so anything over 10 degrees is considered scoliosis. So we have to start the working on getting this unraveled and then calming this musculature down to stop contracting. Pain, doubt, frustration, losing or having familiar things taken away too were all parts of the process. There's no cure, everyone's guessing. But being in the process together at least gave us some hope and an important feeling of participation. Too many times as a patient or caregiver, we're left waiting and hoping for what someone can do for us. This treatment took place up to five days a week for about two and a half months. Dad worked very hard, tried some supplements, and significantly changed his diet. But just as important was the amount and quality of time we spent together. Just like 10 years before, we got to know each other even better. For Dad, that meant getting to know his grandchildren too. And we all learned a new approach and a new definition of health. Health is your body's being able to adapt. If you want to switch out the words, it's really, really simple. Health is an optimal state of the body being able to adapt, but no vicious cycles. You know, you could say it's about function, and it is. I mean, it's about adaptation. You have to understand in this world, the body has to be able to adapt to maintain high level function and not have to then start stealing from Peter from pay, to pay Paul, you know, and, and doing things to cut corners. It has to ultimately be able to adapt to its surroundings to keep the function levels really, really high. It's the conversation of stacking the deck. You stack the deck in your favor. You put everything in your favor that you possibly can do so that you have the absolute chances of winning. It doesn't mean you're going to be bulletproof. No, no one's bulletproof. No, oh God, no one's bulletproof. And Nothing. those are the arguments that kill me. Just ask, well, my grandfather smokes 104, whatever. He maybe had those tremendous genes. It doesn't make mean that smoking made him live to 104 years old. Yeah, he's the anomaly. Yeah. You know, again, it's it's a numbers game and a, and a, over a large enough sample size, the numbers don't lie. So what is adaptation? The ability to accept and thrive in the face of change. Now that works in health business, relationships, pretty universal, right? That often means making the most of what you've been given, even when what you've been given isn't so good. That process is called improvisation, making it up as you go along. Turns out, that's another key component of health. And that's kind of the philosophical approach of improv is like, things are gonna happen, and the thing that I control is my reaction, right? I think when people are struggling with health, mental health, addiction, the, the main like instinct is to isolate and like remove yourself. Either it, it's a form of denial, of shame, you know, of being overwhelmed, hopelessness, despair, all these things make you want to kind of remove yourself and you know, an improvisational approach would be like to wear these types of things with a badge of courage and fully engage more. Many of you may be used to seeing improv perform for laughs, 
and it's great. But it's so much more than that. It improves communication, helps teamwork, and grounds you in the moment. It's being used more and more by top companies around the world. In 2016, Northwestern University teamed up with The Second City, the improv troupe that started it all, to do a study of the impact of improv on those with Parkinson's. The results, from a qualitative standpoint, were very encouraging. They found that everyone completed the study, all of them recommended it, it had very high measures of satisfaction and perceived benefit, and, well, people just liked that others found them to be funny. Let's be honest. Improv rules because it makes us laugh. And the value of laughter and health can't be overstated. Laughter has been called the best medicine. It's attributed to things like boosting the immune system, releasing endorphins, pain relief, stimulating circulation, and helping with depression. One of the ways my dad helps keep us all relatively sane is with his jokes, as he does in this next clip. And just like your dad's, it's a pretty bad joke. Well, there's this guy who could sing out of his ass. His name was Charlie. He'd sing at state fairs, church events, and such. One day he got an invitation to the Ed Sullivan Show. So Ed says, here's Charlie. Charlie comes out, lowers his drawers, and puts a big turd on the floor. Right on the national television. And the hook comes out what? and drags him off the stage. Ed says, what the heck are you doing? Charlie says, can a guy clear his throat? Like we said, we love humor. It really is healthy, cleansing, downright mandatory to survive in the face of aging, pain, and chronic illness. It can also open the door to help about tough, but incredibly important topics like death. My dad sent me an article about a thing called death dinners, where families gather around a meal and talk openly and frankly about what they want to happen when they die. Even though it was uncomfortable, I took it as a cue. You know, it's a great question why people don't like to talk about death. And what we find in our organization when we're out speaking with people is that it's that fear of the unknown. And we, none of us know what happens. What we have in common at the end of the day is each one of us are going to have the same experience. We're all going to die. What about like personally for you guys? I know we, we talked before a little bit about, I mean, do you still wish to be cremated? Is that yes, the idea? I do. Because we do such a wonderful job of preparing for birth and embracing that and celebrating that and we do a wonderful job with preparing how we're going to handle our families, how many children we'll have. I, I really just want to know your guys' wishes. Yeah, whatever. cremation, but be sure we're dead with first. Yeah, okay. with the okay. family, like, like, like Esther. <laughs> I don't want to be alive when I burn it. I'm so glad that's on the record. <laughs> Yet when it comes to the very end, how we're going to die and how we want to be remembered and how we want to be celebrated and honored and what we want to have happen to us when we die. We just don't like to talk about it as a culture. Dad, do you have any, any thoughts about the service, what you would like? Playboy Club. What's that again? Playboy Club. Playboy Club. No, I... <laughs> I'd like you to play a song. Okay. Yeah, very much would like it. Any particular song? On the road again? I mean, I think uh, the acceptance and, and, and embracing and, and, and you know, working your way through the laughter about death um, leads us to uh, a more fulfilled life. I just say, I'd say I'm so happy and so proud of both your families. Mm. It's, It's very easy and enjoyable to walk in your houses. The life and the love that you have in this um, town and this place. And it's so important. And it's. That gives me more peace than anything. I have um, seen great deaths happen because of their family members family members telling a loved one that it's okay to go and that I'm going to be just fine. And when that happens, there's something that's special, almost magical, for the person that's dying and for the person who's letting their loved one go because they're able to release with love 
and release with acceptance. People don't want to die, not because they don't want to die, they don't want to leave their loved ones in a, in a way that's awkward and uncomfortable. And a great death to me is preparation and being grateful for every day that you have. The idea of a great death is an extraordinary concept. We all know we're going to die, even if we don't like to talk about it. But the quality of the way we go is, all too often, not so good. We learned that talking about it, facing it realistically, and communicating what we want can give us the freedom to live better today. Okay, so in terms of our discoveries with Boys of Summer, over the 16 years we've been at it, we've talked about community, health, improvisation, laughter, and death. One other really important discovery was the impact of activity on Parkinson's, even an unexpected activity like boxing. The importance of calling them athletes versus patients or Parkinsonians? Because they're athletes. I'm exhausted after two classes and I don't do anything. <laughs> they're athletes. Do you think they forget they're athletes? I think they've forgotten before they come here. I mean, I look at it as they're fighting for their lives. I, you know, they lost a certain part of their lives with this. Getting up and off the floor, that's the first thing we do in class. And that's like, all right, I'm saying right now, well, I don't want to swear, but Parkinson's. <laughs> I'm just not going to be that person that's in a waiting room of a doctor's office. I'm going to be that athlete in a gym, and I'm going to be working out hard. I want to understand where their hearts are, where their minds are, and I want them to feel really safe here. We're going to work with all of it, their mind, their body, their heart, with all of it. The mirror time is really important for me because I know with my dad, he said negative thoughts to himself. Oh, my body can't do this anymore. Oh, I used to could do this. They don't give each other an, uh, enough credit. I want you to look that guy in the mirror and I want you to tell him, why are you proud of him today? Well, he, uh, he put on some gloves for the first time in 50 years and Ralph showed me how. And uh, I, I think I know the difference between a left cross and a right, <laughs> left tab and a right cross. Thanks, Ralph. And now tell, tell that guy you love him. I love you. <laughs> One of the gifts of second base was watching my dad take even greater charge of his health. He lost and has kept off almost 40 pounds. He's increased his strength and reached out to social groups that help him remember he's funny, charming, and not alone. Even in a world as isolated and divided as the one we currently inhabit, we've found ways to adapt, improvise, get together, and laugh. This is a group called Improv to Improve Parkinson's. We've been playing online together twice a week since COVID-19 shut so many other things down. It's part of my studies in my PhD program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. My emphasis is looking at the effect of improvisation on Parkinson's. That study by Northwestern is the only one of its kind right now. So I'm trying to yes and that in the best way I know how. These films and the responses to them have continued to push us to find what's next and share that with others. While we are Parkinson's specific, the issues of aging, health, caregiving, family, and dying are absolutely universal. As I mentioned, we've just finished with the third film in this five part series. Here's some feedback we got from our online premiere. Um, losing both my parents over the time you've made the films um, and watching how you guys have been together as a family is really inspiring. So by, by seeing the opportunities that we have to do things, to continue to live, I mean, 20 years is a long time to live with Parkinson's. And clearly Dan is taking that, taking the bull by the horns and just going with it and going forward. I always love a, a film or a story um, that I can take, even though the subject is Parkinson's, that I can take it in a broader sense and apply it to my life or anybody's life and, and get some um, wisdom from that. And there's, there are so many slices of wisdom in this and the importance of not isolating and looking at what you can do. So what's next? Well, I just got funding for a program called Day One PD Superheroes. The intent in this pilot program is to bridge the gap and combat the fear people have about having PD from diagnosis to daily life. We'll be recruiting online in July 2020 
and plan to have the program up and running by August. You can get more information at www.i2ipd.com. As a matter of fact, here's all the contact information. Take a moment and please take a screenshot, whatever you need to do, so that you can get a hold of me. I look forward to hearing from you, and thank you very much for your time.